Due Process and the Code Enforcement Due process is the fundamental concept in our legal and ethical systems. It ensures fair treatment and protection of the individual's rights when facing accusations or disciplinary actions. In the context of the Realtors Code of Ethics Enforcement, due process is critical component to guarantee fairness and integrity in the resolution of disputes or alleged violation. So I'd like to cover some of the steps of the due process. The first one is the complaint and the investigation. The complaint and the investigation within the due process of the enforcement of the code plays a crucial role in upholding the standards of professionalism. The process is designed to address alleged violations of the code to ensure that the ethical conduct is maintained. <clears throat> the process begins when a complaint is lodged against a local realtor at their local board or association. Now, complaints can be filed, believe it or not, by clients, by other realtors, or members of the public who believe a realtor is violating the code of ethics. Upon receiving a complaint, the board initiates a review to assess its validity. This involves an initial evaluation of the allegations to determine whether they fall within the scope of the code of ethics. Remember, these are not license law issues. These are code of ethics issues. License law issues would go to the state. If the complaint is deemed worthy of an investigation, the respondent, that's the person who has the allegation made against, is notified. This notification outlines the specific charge and provides an opportunity for the respondent to respond. Then there is an investigation process is initiated wherein the, the board gathers relevant information, interviews involved parties, examines pertinent documents. This phase is, aims to establish the facts surrounding the alleged violation. Depending on the severity or complexity of the case, the panel or hearing may be convened. This is the grievance panel in Indiana. This panel reviews the evidence and assesses whether a violation may have occurred based upon what was stated. Now, this is the part that always gets me. I served on the grievance committee for a number of years. I had a hard problem with this because all the grievance committee does is determine if there has been a violation may have occurred based on what was told to them. This is not a guilty or not guilty kind of case. This is, was the complaint a violation or could it be a violation based on how it was presented? <clears throat> Following the investigation, the decision is rendered and if a violation is found, sanctions can be opposed. The sanctions do, can range from anything. They can edu more education, uh, fines, all the way up to the suspension from the board, all right? There is a section about confidentiality that is a critical aspect of this. The identified parties involved, as well as the details of the complaint and investigation are kept confidential to protect the privacy and reputation of all parties. So that's the first step. Then comes the notification. The notification process is a vital component with the due process. This phase ensures that all parties involved, especially the respondent, that's the guy that's being charged or girl, are informed about the allegations. All right. If the complaint is deemed worthy, like we state, stated earlier, there will formal notification is sent to the respondent. This notification outlines the charges and details 
the allegation of any violation. Could be multiple violations, all right? The notification includes a detailed account of all the allegations, specifying the actions or conduct that are believed to be in violation. This information is provided to enable the respondent to comprehend and understand the charges that are being levied against them. The notification or response process is designed to uphold the principle of the due process. That's the main purpose of it. The third step in this would be the hearing and the review. It's a critical stage in the due process. This phase typically occurs when a complainant or a complaint is filed against the realtor. There is a formation of a hearing panel. All right, I now serve on the professional standards hearing panel. This is the panel that actually hears the case, all right? There is a notification to all the parties once again, and this notification though includes things like the date, the time, and the location of the hearing, giving people plenty of time to get ready. During the hearing, both parties have an opportunity to present evidence, call witnesses, and provide testimony. This evidence can be anything that is needed to support their case, documents, records. Uh, it could be other people. You could have witnesses. Both the complainant and the respondent have the right to legal representation during this hearing. You guys can hire an attorney. Legal counsel helps to ensure that each party's rights are protected. They will review the evidence following the presentation of all the evidence and all the testimonies. The hearing panel will inform all the parties whether there was a violation or not. This panel will deliberate to reach a decision based on the evidence presented. This decision may involve determining whether there was actually a violation at all, the severity of the violation, and the sanction of the violation. Once this decision has been reached, all parties involved are notified of the outcome. So this hearing and review process is structured to guarantee a fair and impartial examination of the alleged violation. Now, we talked about you are allowed to have legal representation. Both parties have the right to legal representation throughout the entire process. When a complaint is lodged and the investigation begins, both the complainant and the respondent have the right to engage a legal counsel. This legal representation becomes especially relevant in the response phase where the respondent prepares and submits a written allegation or a written report against the allegation, all right? During the hearing and review phase, the attorney is going to assist in preparing for the hearing and reviewing your evidence, formulating the legal arguments, and ensuring that the rights of the client are upheld during this process. The attorney is going to play a role in any cross-examine. He may have questions that of credibility of evidence, challenge testimonies, present legal arguments that support his own client's position. Overall, the legal representation is a safeguard that helps balance the power dynamic with the enforcement process because you are going to feel overwhelmed when you look at five or six people on the panel and realize that you're sitting there by yourself. So having a licensed attorney could help you balance the power. Now, during that evidence that we talked about, you have a right to present evidence to defend yourself and you can break down that evidence in several different ways. You're going to compile all the evidence. You're going to submit all of the evidence. There is a time frame by which that evidence must be submitted and if you fail to hit that time frame, your evidence may not be admitted in this hearing. You can call witnesses. People that have relevant information can be identified in your uh, documentation that you send. 
and they could involve directly involved in the real estate transaction or people with firsthand knowledge of the circumstances surrounding this alleged violation. This is a formal hearing, so you do have the right to cross-examine the other side's witnesses and challenge any cred credibility or evidence that they have. You also have the right to call expert witnesses. Maybe you need to call somebody that has specialized knowledge or opinions relevant to this allegation. Documentary evidence. Alongside these testimonies and witnesses, you might provide documents such as contracts or emails, screen caps of texts, transaction records. All of these are going to be submitted or could be. Remember that the authenticity and relevance of these documents are going to be scrutinized. So make sure that you have dotted your I's and crossed your T's. This is going to be followed by the decision and sanctions period. Now, at the end of the previous section that we just talked about, where they're going to present evidence, there, this tribunal is actually going to have a decision. All right. There's going to be a de deliberation. At the conclusion of the evidence uh, presentation, they are going to carefully review all the evidence, testimonies, legal arguments, all of that. They're going to decide whether there has been a violation of the code of the evidence, code of ethics based upon the evidence that was presented. If a violation is found, then the next thing the hearing panel is going to consider is the severity of the breach. They may weigh such factors as the nature of the violation. Are there mitigating circumstances? The potential impact on the parties involved? then they're going to actually determine a sanction. They're going to determine an appropriate sanction to back up this violation. The sanction aim is to address the violation and it may include a range of anything. Could be more education, could be a monetary fine, they could suspend you, they could put you on probation, they can flat out ex expel you from the, the board. That's the ultimate. There is an appeals process afterwards, which is optional, obviously. Um, the appeals process is a critical component. It provides a mechanism for the parties dissatisfied with the outcome of the decision, particularly after the hearing, to seek a review of the decision. Now, if that happens, there are certain steps. You must file for an appeal. The decision might be appealed on the grounds of procedural errors or misinterpretation of the code or other significant issues. Little side note here. I don't believe you have the right to appeal because you just didn't like their answer. You have got to prove there is a reason for an appeal. If you file a formal appeal, then there will, they will create, or the board will then create a review panel or an appellate body to go back over and relook at all of the evidence that was presented during the original case. This panel, by the way, is distinctly different from the original panel. All right. So it's not the same people looking at it again. There could be written arguments as to why the appeal should be granted. There could be oral arguments as to why the appeal should be granted. The appellate, the appellate body reviews the procedural and substantial issues related to the case. They include the original hearings due process, whether decision was based on the correct interpretation and whether the sanctions were opposed appropriately. Now, once that appellate body, party, I almost said body, got it confused, makes a decision, they're obviously going to notify everybody of the outcome. There is another crucial aspect of this process is confidentiality. 
It ensures that the privacy and reputation of the individuals involved in this enforcement are protected. These proceedings and this enforcement process, all the way from the receipt of the complaint to the final decision, is treated with confidentiality. Information related to the case, including the identity of the complainant, the respondent, and any witnesses is kept confidential to the extent that's obviously allowed by your state's law or ethical guidelines. Parties involved in this will be required to sign a non-disclosure agreement. This legal document reinforces the importance of the discretion. It's also a closed hearing. Formal hearings conducted as part of this enforcement are very often closed to the public to protect the privacy of the parties. Any of the information that's used that's related to this process can only be shared on a need to know basis with very specific personnel. The association may communicate this complaint with re respondents about the progress of the case but the details are typically limited. Even after the decision has made, there is a post-decision confidentiality. So that confidentiality form you signed not only covers the process, but it covers the outcome post-decision. So maintaining the confidentiality of this uh, enforcement process is essential preserving the integrity and in the process and fostering a trust within our community because it strikes a balance between some transparency and protection of the individuals involved. Now, the last thing is it does provide some educational opportunities. So when there's a violation occurred, one of the most common things the hearing panel or tribunal does is assign more education to the respondent if they were found in violation. They try and make that tailored education. So if the problem was in say property management ethics, they might tailor that education to ask that respondent to get more continuing ed inside of that property management arena. That's just an example. <clears throat> When they assign this education, there is a timeline. They set a timeline by which you must have your educational requirements completed. If you fail to complete your educational requirements within that timeline, there is already a pre-established next level, if you will. We talk about this all the time. Here's what we're going to do to this Realtor. If they fail, then here's the next step. So it's already in the chute, so to speak, when this is handed down. By incorporating due process, this whole thing that we've just been talking about, it ensures that the rights of all the parties are respected. It promotes fairness and transparency and accountability within our profession. The aim is to maintain and the integrity of the code of ethics and uphold our highest standards of professionalism.